welcome back everyone for today's video we are going to be taking a look at my eighth round game where i was playing with the black pieces against notarbek abdu satora from uzbekistan now notarbek has lost two games in a row going to this eighth round having a very difficult tournament as such i wasn't sure what to expect let's jump right into the action so here we go starting with the white pieces notarbek and i am playing with the black pieces and the game starts with e4 now, in this game, I choose to play e5, and as I alluded to, Noterbeck had lost two games in a row. He's playing me in round 8, and he's playing Magus in round 9. Now, as such, I wasn't really sure what to expect. Obviously, with a rest day yesterday, Noterbeck had some time to regroup, and I thought that because of that, he'd probably try to be very aggressive rather than being very solid. So I decided to play e5 and see what he is up to. Noterbeck plays knight to f3, and now I play the move knight to c6. Here, Noterbeck plays bishop b5 and this is sort of the first big surprise for me i was actually expecting noterbeck to play bishop c4 and for us to have some kind of classic gucci piano but instead he plays bishop b5 and now i go knight to f6 playing my classic berlin defense and he decides to castle now this of course came as a big surprise but on the other hand noterbeck did play this move bishop takes c6 a couple rounds ago against fabiano caruana and he did lose with the white pieces so Noterbeck castles, I play knight takes e4, and now he plays rook to e1, I go knight to d6, knight takes e5, and now of course I play this move bishop to e7, obviously if I capture the bishop, I lose the game due to the classic check, as well as the fossil here, and if I lose the queen and do a Botez gambit, well, I'm not winning the tournament. So I decide to play bishop e7, Noterbeck plays bishop f1, and now we trade, I castle, d4, and now I play bishop f6, and here Noterbeck plays rook e2. Now, this is, of course, the exact same position that I had in round numero uno against Wesley So from the United States. Now, in this game, I play the move knight to c4. Now, there are many options here. There's knight c4, there's b6, knight f5, rook e8 also is potentially playable as well, and with all these different options, I decide to go for the most unusual one, which is knight to c4. Now, the reason for this move is that the computer suggested that's the reason I played it. Obviously, without computers, I never would have come up with a move like knight c4 because it violates all of the basic opening principles. First of all, I'm jumping with the knight. And why am I doing that? Because now white can play b3 attacking the knight, and I have to waste time moving the knight again. So I'm moving the knight all over the place. I'm not developing the queenside pieces. What am I even doing? But the computers have shown that these sorts of ideas are completely fine. And in fact, it's a very deep concept because the computer is showing that it can actually think well beyond the simple calculations. And what it's saying is you force white to start pushing P. And as we know in the game of chess, once you push a pawn, you can never push it backwards. So what I'm doing here is I'm provoking Noterbeck to have to start pushing his queenside pawns. And already I'm feeling pretty good. So here, Noterbeck plays the move a4 after a bit of a think. And now I play this move knight to d5, moving my knight once again. I've played one, two, three knight moves in, in a row. And of course, I'm basically just trying to provoke Noterbeck to start pushing p everywhere. And once he pushes p, this will eventually create a bunch of weaknesses. So if white were to play c4 here after knight to e7 and knight c3, I can now play this move c5 here, undermining the pawn in the center. If white plays a move like bishop e3, now I have knight to f5. And suddenly there's a lot of pressure on this diagonal and the pawn on d4 is exceptionally weak so Noterbeck here plays rookie one after a bit of a think and now I play this move knight to e7 now this is a move that I thought was imprecise if not outright incorrect but I couldn't remember exactly how the lines go here and that's why I played this move with one very simple idea in mind I want to create the sim symmetrical structure. So what I'm aiming for here is, let's just say white plays f3. It's, uh, it's not the right move. But what I want here is I want this structure where I get this chain of pawns in the center of the board. And if white goes c3, we have symmetry here. And just in general, if I get this pawn chain from b7 to d5, I should be completely fine. So I play knight to e7. Now the computer says that d6, bishop b2, and potentially c5 here, or even bishop f5 is much better. But you know what? I felt that if I get the structure with the connect 3, I can never lose the game. So Noterbeck plays c3. I play d5. He goes a5 here. And now I play c6, creating my chain. And he goes pawn to b4. Here I play this move knight to f5. And we have something very funny occurring in the game after the following moves. Bishop to d3 and g6. Now, what I started to realize during the game when Noterbeck played bishop f4 and knight g7 is this is actually very close to an, a direct transposition to another variation in the system, except white's pawns are on b4 and a5 here. So to give you guys an example, let me go all all the way back here to the opening so as you go back to the opening instead of playing d4 bishop f6 and rook e2 white can play white can play this move c3 and after knight to e8 d4 d5 one of the main lines which is drawn in a lot of games here is this line sorry bishop 
is bishop to f6, rook to e1, d5, bishop f4, knight d6. And here we get this move, bishop to d3. And after c6, knight d2, bishop to f5, takes, takes, knight to f3, g6. We have the same position as in the game. Now, I think my move order there was a little bit wonky. I don't think it's actually the correct order. I think the correct order, sorry, was, was this order with... Um, was this order of g6 bishop d3 knight g7 knight g2 c6 knight f3 not knight d6 so i got that a little bit wrong but of course i'm here doing the recap on the fly so i apologize for that at any rate when you look at this position with the knight on d2 here after let's just say rook e2 and bishop f5 you'll notice that when we compare this with, with the game which i will now show you guys in one second right here you'll notice that this position is very similar except the pawns are on b4 and a5 versus being on b2 and a2 but nonetheless i felt that with this pawn structure of the chain of three i should never be in danger of losing the game so i felt pretty good here even though i've let white push a lot of p on the queen side and take a bunch of space so after bishop f5 noterbeck plays bishop f1 and this was the first sign to me that noterbeck was once again being a little bit too cocky and feeling like he had an advantage when he probably doesn't have all that much going on so after bishop f1, I played bishop e7, he goes knight b3, and now I play bishop d6. Idea is here, the light square bishops, his bishop on f1 is very passive, my bishop on f5 is very active, and I want to trade off the dark square bishops here. If I can trade off the bishops, for example, even though white has more space on the queen side, it doesn't really mean a whole lot, because I simply have no weaknesses here. So after bishop d6, Noterbeck plays bishop g3. Now, one thing that I would also add is that generally I have seen Noterbeck play a lot of games. And one of the things that I've sensed is you can tell when he's feeling very good about his position, when he's starting to get confident. And I could already tell around this point that he was starting to think that he had a big advantage. And that made me feel sort of actually very good about the fact that I could maybe get some chances if he was too optimistic. So here I play queen c7, Noterbeck plays knight c5. And now after a long think, I trade and play rook a e8. Now, I really did not want to do this initially. I wanted to play b6 here, but I was actually kind of concerned that after knight to a6 and queen d6, white can go b5 here. And in the long run, once we get this position here with the structure with c3, b4 versus d5, I thought this pawn on d5 could become a big weakness. And that's why I used so much time before deciding to go for this trade and rook a to e8 here. Now, additionally, another reason I did this trade was that in the end game, if white has double pawns down the road, I can probably even sacrifice a pawn on the queen side, and it should be a draw due to the fact that white's extra pawn will be a stacked g pawn. So those are the reasons that I did this, and now Noterbeck trades and goes b5 here, trying to be aggressive and keep the game going. Here I take, and I go rook to d8. Now, already here, I was starting to think that Noterbeck was getting a little bit too overconfident, because even though it looks like white has an advantage, potentially, with the weak pawn on d5, if I can kick the horse out of c5, then suddenly the pawn on c3 becomes very weak. So Noterbeck goes queen b3, I play knight to e6, we trade the knights, and after queen b4 and rook c8, I actually offered Noterbeck a draw here for one very simple reason. Position should be roughly balanced due to the weakness on c3 versus the weakness on b7 potentially. Additionally, I didn't really see how I could create play and win the game. So I offered a draw, but Noterbeck decided to decline the draw and plays on with rook a3. I play h5 here, stopping him from ever going f3 and g4 because now the pawn will always be hanging on g3. And if you go g4, I simply capture the pawn. So now there's always a permanent weakness on g3, and I thought maybe I could be a little bit better here. Noterbeck plays bishop e2. I go king g7. He plays queen b2. I go king g8. And already here, I think this is a little bit of a mistake what i probably should have done here is i should have probably played this move rook to e8 trying to put pressure on the bishop here because if white plays bishop to f3 there might even be tricks like h4 here and after takes this idea with bishop g4 because if white takes the free bishop suddenly we have the classic ice skater here the king is stuck on g1 there are no squares available and it's already getting very tricky for white to play now in my mind, because I thought that I couldn't do a whole lot, I actually decided to try and just be passive and repeat moves and get to the promised land where we'd have an Armageddon and place all my chips on the game tomorrow against Fabiano. So I basically repeat here. We get a lot of repetitions here. Not a whole lot is going on. Um, Noterbeck just keeps on, keeps the game going. And we reach this critical moment right around here where I started to feel like I should have something because, again, I have a very active Bishop on F5 versus his path to bishop on e2 but nonetheless my rook is tied down to this pawn on b7 as is my queen so i can't really go after the pawn and i'd also love to stack on the e file here but if we get a position like this and i infiltrate i still have no way to proceed because if i go rook to e7 white can simply take the juicer here and if I play h4, white wins a pawn. If I go bishop g4, I hang the pawn on d5. So even if I get the maximum position here with the queen on the e file, it's still not all that much. So I play bishop to e6 instead. He goes rook to b5. I play queen c6. And after rook c5, queen d6, 
Noderbeck plays queen b4 here, trying to trade off the rooks. I go b6, we trade. And here Noderbeck plays this move a6, which also really surprised me. I was sure that he was going to take on b6. And after all the, all the queens are traded here, this position should simply be a draw here, even though it's the same color bishops. Even number of pawns, not a whole lot going on for either side. But then Noderbeck played a6, which really surprised me because I felt that in the long run, this pawn could become a weakness. So I go king g7, he plays king f1. Now I go king to f6. I really wanted to play this move h4 here, opening up some, opening up this diagonal. But after takes and queen to h2, first of all, white has f3 here, and the game will simply end in a draw by repetition. And I also wasn't 100% sure what was going on after king e1. Queen takes g2, and then queen to e7, going after this pawn on a7. Now the computer, of course, doesn't care. It says check, queen a1, queen a7, queen b2. Actually, I guess this is... This is actually already good, but after queen a1, maybe there's queen c7 here to guard the pawn on c3. But with this weak pawn on a7 and the white pawn being two squares away from queening, I simply didn't see the point in going for such a variation. So I play king f6, Noderbeck goes king g1, I play queen e7, and after queen b2, I regrettably have to make a repetition with queen c7. I would love to play queen d6 here, but unfortunately now white can play c4. If I take on c4, there's d5 with the classic fossil, and I lose the game here on the spot. And if I don't take and I go king e7, now white can maybe even go c5 and after takes queen b7, suddenly the a pawn on a7 is hanging here. And with this pawn two squares away from queening, white is much better at the very least. So I'd love to get this position with queen d6 and say king e7. And I feel like in this position, maybe I can start to play on. I can walk the king over to the queen side, maybe go for some bishop d7 and some kind of b5 idea here, because if takes, there's queen b6. But again, I need the king all the way on the queen side in order for these ideas to work. And unfortunately, I can't get it, because if I go queen d6 or c4, and after queen c7, he plays queen b4, preventing me from going king e7, and now I can't place the queen on d6, covering this diagonal. So at this point, the game ends in a draw by repetition, and we move on to the Armageddon. Now, on the one hand, I was both happy. I was happy that the game ended a draw. On the other hand, I was also a little bit disappointed because I felt like at, at a certain point, I had some chances with the rooks on the board. But overall, it was never really there in any kind of tangible way. So we draw the class game. That means we both get one point and we move to the classic Armegadon. And now again, I have the black pieces. Noderbeck has the white piece with 10 minutes and I have seven minutes. Now, one of the things that's worth noting is that it was very difficult after this classical game to sort of reset because with this with this draw in classical combined with Fabiano's draw and his victory in Armageddon, regardless of the result in this Armageddon game, I have to win tomorrow to get first place. But nonetheless, you still have to play the game. So the Armageddon game starts with e4. I play e5. We get knight f3, knight c6. And again, Noderbeck decides to go into the Berlin here. Same line with rookie one, knight d6, knight e5, bishop e7, and bishop f1. And now I decide to play the other variation here, which is knight to f5, trying to stop white from playing d4 in one turn. Noderbeck plays knight to f3, and after castles, white is now able to play d4 because the knight and the queen support the pawn. However, after d5, we're once again headed towards a symmetry where I get this chain of three pawns here, and I should be completely fine. And this this also, in general, when I've looked at a lot of these rookie one lines, the general belief is if you get the symmetry, you get this chain from b7 to d5, and white has this chain from b2 to d4, you should always be fine. So Noderbeck plays knight f1. Again, I go g6, so that after bishop d2, I can play knight g7. Idea to play bishop f5 and trade off the light square bishops. Once again, the bishop on d3 very, very nicely plays for white, so I would love to exchange it off the board. So Noderbeck plays knight g3, stopping bishop f5. I could still play it, but here white will have the bishop pair, and white should be better. So I play knight e to f5 here. He goes queen b3, and now I find this very nice move, knight to h4. I could have also traded here and played queen c7 with the idea of bishop f5, but knight to h4 is a little bit better because he has to trade the knights here. If you go knight e5, I have f6 kicking the knight away. If you go back, your pawns are not really well placed here. And if you go to c4, you hang the hang the juicer. G4 also hangs a horse, so white would have to go back. So Noderbeck trades, and he plays knight to f1. I go queen d8, plays h3, and now I go knight e6. Now, at this point, I'm feeling really, really good about the position here. White doesn't have the c4 break because the pawn on d4 is hanging. Additionally, I can play bishop f4 and try to trade more pieces, but white doesn't have a whole lot. Maybe the pawn on b7 is weak, but without the c4 idea and a closed e file, white can't be better at all here. 
So Notarbeck plays bishop h6, and now I play rook e8. Now, now the computer says that I can actually play knight f4, sacking the rook on f8. So if white takes the rook, now I have queen g5, and after knight g3, king f8, bishop f1, I have h5, and with this awesome knife on f4, followed by h4, black is actually much better here. Nonetheless, in a blitz game, you have to sort of figure out where you want to use your time. And I just decided to play rook e8 right away. Notarbeck plays g3 to cut off knight to f4. I play bishop d7, and now he plays knight to h2. Now, in retrospect, I think in this position, I should have just played knight g7 here. Same idea of bishop f5, but also trying to trade off a set of rooks. Nonetheless, I play bishop d7, and Notarbeck plays knight h2. Now, if he were to capture the pawn on b7, this would be an epic mistake, because after rook to b8, queen a7, I can simply force a repetition here. The queen has no squares except for b7. Otherwise, you're doing a Botez gambit, and a draw is what I want here to secure the extra half point. So Notarbeck plays knight to h2 instead, and now I go bishop f8, trying to trade the bishops. He takes, I take with the king, he goes to h4, now I play queen c7. Now already here, I think queen c7 is probably wrong. I think again, I should have played knight g7, trying to trade the rooks. Less material on the board means there are less chances to lose. But I was actually concerned that maybe Notarbrook could take the pawn on b7. But after rook b8 and queen a7, apparently I can just take on b2 and I'm fine. All that I saw was rook a8, queen c5, and after king g8, queen a3, I'm simply down a pawn here. So I play queen c7 to guard the pawn on b7. Notarbeck plays knight f3. I play king g7. Again, knight g7 probably would have saved the game, but I just play king g7 instead. We get knight to e5. I play bishop c8. And now after this move, queen c2, I make a huge mistake. I play this horrible, horrible move c5. Now, this move is inexplicable, I think, other than the fact that, frankly, it's just been a long day. I'm tired, and I'm just moving on field without doing any deep calculations. What I should have played here was probably this move knight to f8, followed by f6. And again, after queen to d2, for example, f6, knight to f3, I can simply trade the rooks and play something like bishop g4, knight to h2, and bishop e6, followed by rook e8, and I simply am completely fine here. I think I would have drawn this very, very easily if I had played it. But again, sort of just playing on field, not doing deep calculations, and I thought c5, why not? If white takes, I take back. It's simplification, one less pawn on the board. Bring the bishop into the game, maybe win the knight. But all my moves are very easy. So sort of c5 is a move that I just played on pure intuition and feel. It's just like, I'm just going to move. I don't want to calculate. And it turns out to be a big mistake because of this move. Bishop b5, rook to e7, and now queen to d2. Now, again, you're probably wondering, well, what's the big, big deal with c5? Now, the problem with c5 here is that in this position... If I take on d4, white does not have to take. If white were to take on d4 here after this move, h5, the pawn on d4 is actually quite weak here, and I should be completely fine. But if I take on d4, white has this very nasty move, knight to g4, followed by queen to h6, and out of nowhere, I think white is doing very well. Now, probably I should have done this anyway, um, and I spent a lot of time calculating this f5, queen h6 line, or sorry, f5, rook e6 line. Um, and apparently after fg4 takes and queen d4, it looks very, very bad. I'm losing a pawn on d5 here. I also have double pawns on g4 and g6. And computer isn't saying it's lost, but it, I feel like in a blitz game, I would lose this 99% of the time. Additionally, even this other line with queen h6, king h8, and knight to f6 is extremely scary. The threats with mates on f8 potentially, mates on h7, and it's just impossible to play. Nonetheless, I think I probably should have just done it anyway, because when I played knight to f8, now Notarbeck just plays h5 instantly, and out of nowhere, I'm just completely lost. Simply because white has h6 with ideas like queen f4 and queen g5, and the lolly checkmate. And if I take on d4 here, white can even just take with the queen. And now I have problems on diagonal, the pawn on d5 is weak, and it's all collapsing in a heap. So I end up playing c4 here, and the idea behind c4 is simply play a move. Because um, I didn't want to take the pawn. I didn't, want, I didn't think I could play f6, so I just play c4. It says, play a move. You're running out of time. Just play a move. So I go c4. Notarbeck plays h6. I play king g8. And now he goes queen to f4, threatening to go queen f6 with the classic lolly checkmate on g7. Here I play f5 after a long think, and now Notarbeck correctly sacks the horse on c4. What I probably should have played was this move bishop to f5, but after g4, f6 takes, takes, and takes. It's simply hopeless here. This bishop on b5 is actually very well placed. It covers some critical squares. Additionally, the pawns are very weak in the center of the board, and it's just totally, totally hopeless here. Say g takes f5, rook a d1, and rook d8. After queen g5, knight g6, and a move like rook to d4, the pawns on d5 and c4 are weak. The king is weak on g8. f5 is hanging. If I take on e5, I lose in one turn. So I can't take the knight due to the pin. And if I take with the queen, I lose the rook on d8. So it's just totally hopeless here. Nothing I can really do. 
Nonetheless, this is what I should have played, but instead I just played f5, so I, I couldn't find a move. And if I go knight e6 here, which is another move, after queen to f6, I can't ever move the knight due to the lolly on g7. I can't even move my rook because then I lose the rook here. And if I'm not able to play queen e7 in the next move or two, this surely is going to collapse very, very soon. So I play f5, Noterbeck sacks the horse on c4. I end up playing queen takes queen here. If I were to take the knight, which is the other option, after bishop takes pawn, checking the king, if I move my king to h8, for example, white can trade the queens and go rook to e8 here. And it's just gg, why not, due to the pins and the horse being under attack on f8. And if I play queen takes c4 after rook takes e7, now there's rook g7, let's just say knight e6, queen e5. And there are all kinds of checkmates here. My bishop, my rook, and my queen are just out to lunch and doing absolutely nothing. Additionally, if I play this move knight to e6, which is the last option, white simply trades all the pieces off here and at the end of the day when we do the counting there's uno dos tres cuatro cinco and white has uno dos tres cuatro cinco seis siete so white has two extra pawns and it's just totally hopeless so i trade the queens i play knight to e6 completely missing knight b6 but of course it doesn't matter at all and i play rook b8 and i just resign in disgust realizing that after knight takes d5 there simply is nothing i can do i can go rook f7 but after bishop c4 or even knight b6 white has all these extra pawns in the center of the board my pieces are very passive, and there's just no hope whatsoever. So unfortunately, I have to resign the game. And with that, I lose the Armageddon game, but I still do ensure that I get one point in the classical portion. Now, this sets us up for a very exciting final round tomorrow. I will have the white pieces against Fabiano Caruano. And in this game, I will be down by two and a half points. Now, based on the scoring system, if you win a classical game, you get three points. So basically, the situation is pretty clear cut. Barring anything crazy happening in the game between Gukesh and Wesley, if I do not lose my game, I almost certainly will get second place. But if I win my game in classical against Fabiano, I will get clear first place and all the rubles. So... Very, very big game coming up tomorrow in round number nine. I will have the white pieces. Obviously, these chances don't come around all the time, so I'm going to give it my best shot. Uh, nonetheless, it's going to be really exciting. I won't spoil any of the secrets. I Even right now, I haven't really thought about it since I'm doing this recap right after I got back to the hotel. But I'm going to do my best, give it my best shot, and I will be back tomorrow, you guys, with a recap after the ninth and final round of Norway Chess when I play with the white piece against Fabiana Caruana. So once again, hope you guys enjoyed this recap. Make sure to hit that subscribe button below if you haven't already, and I'll be back tomorrow with my final recap from Norway Chess. See you guys soon. Bye.